On behalf of the Emory Libraries and the Stuart A. Rose Manuscript Archives and Rare Book Library, I'm thrilled to welcome you to tonight's special event, Sister Writers, an evening with Pearl Clegg and Tiari Jones. My name is, let's just, round of applause is in order. <laughs> My name is Jennifer Meehan. I serve as Interim Director of the Rose Library. Our mission in the Rose Library is to collect and connect stories of human experience, to promote access and learning, and to create opportunities for dialogue for all wise hearts who seek knowledge. As part of our mission, we offer programs such as this one, and we put on exhibits to explore and share stories from the collections such as the exhibit which inspired this program, She Gathers Me, Networks Among Black Women Writers, curated by Gabrielle Dudley, instruction archivist in the Rose Library, and our moderator here tonight. Another round of applause. She Gathers Me explores the networks among black women writers through an examination of the connections found within their letters, journals, calendars, and photographs. One story explored in the exhibit is the intimate connection between our guests this evening. New York Times bestselling author and new Emory faculty member, Tiari Jones. We're just gonna keep applauding. <laughs> and nationally recognized playwright, poet, novelist, and social activist, Pearl Clegg, whose papers are amongst the Rose Library's collections. In discussion together, they will share more of the story of their intimate connection of mentorship and writing. We hope that you will visit this exhibit, which is currently on display in the Rose Library, now through next Wednesday, October 3rd, so it's final days. Just a few logistical notes before we start our discussion. I wanna let everyone know that the event is being streamed through Facebook Live on the Emory University website, and we're also videotaping the event. Following the discussion, there will be time for questions from the audience. If you wish to ask a question, we're gonna ask that you line up at one of the two mics whoops, that will be set up for you. And then following the program, the author's books will be for sale and the two authors will be signing books in the foyer and we'll ask you to line up for that at the back of the ballroom. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Gabrielle Dudley. Gabrielle M. Dudley is the Instruction Archivist in the Stuart A. Rose Manuscript Archives and Rare Book Library. In this role, she partners with faculty to develop courses and research assignments that draw heavily from the materials in the Rose Library. Gabrielle recently facilitated a grant-funded project that used the papers of black women writers to teach archives research skills to students at Emory and Spelman College. And she's curator of the exhibit, She Gathers Me, Networks Among Black Women Writers. Gabrielle, turning it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for that great introduction. Um, I uh, want to thank you both so much for uh, being here this evening. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to have the two of you on this stage here at Emory tonight. Um, this conversation has really been um, a it's really been something that's been years in the making for me, and um, I'll give you a sort of a brief story about why. So in preparation for the She Gathers Me exhibition, I knew that most people's interactions with writers, specifically black women writers, came from would probably come from their published works. But it was actually through looking in your papers, Pearl, um, that I began to see how ex your extensive relationships, looking at your correspondence, um, you had extensive relationships with other black women writers, and of course, uh, people like uh, Tiari. And this really sparked this idea of exploration between writing networks with black women. Um, then I became curious about whether other writers in Rose Library, black women writers in Rose Library, um, also had these relationships visible within their personal papers, and they actually did. Um, so it was basically your relationship, you and Tiari's relationship, um, that was a springboard for um, a personal and professional um, sort of endeavor for me. So thank you both for that. Um, could you start by telling us a bit about how the two of you met 
and how your relationship has grown over the years for those that might not be familiar. Do you want me to start? Well, I think <laughs> I think you just makes you start to say that we met before we met because Pearl was a friend of my parents. Mm -hmm. And so when I met Pearl, she was she was the first writer I ever met. I always I love to say I met a writer and she was my teacher. <laughs> and I mentioned her to my dad and he called her, he said, Young Pearl? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Reverend Clegg's daughter from Detroit. <laughs> so there were, so we were connected before we were connected. But she was teaching um, creative writing class at Spelman College. We're both graduates of Spelman. And I wanted to take the class. I wasn't old enough to take the class because you had to be, I think, a junior or something to take the class. But I always wanted to be a writer. I had never seen a writer. And there was a writer. And I wanted to take a class. So <laughs> you know, I, I weighed my options. And I decided that I had no choice but to, I think forge is too strong of a word for it, to. <laughs> approximate the signature of my advisor <laughs> <laughs> allowing uh -oh. me to take the class. <laughs> and I will let Earl take over from here. <laughs> I don't even think I ever knew that, that that was a choice thing. Well, I, I didn't want to make you an accessory no. after that. <laughs> I hadn't been teaching long, um, and I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, so that I had way too many people in that class. Wasn't your class a huge class where I had so many so people? Many. Because whoever came to me and said, oh, I really want to take your class, I would say, oh, okay. So it ended <laughs> up, I mean, it was just, it was ridiculous. Um, but most of the, um, of the young women in there, they may have read something that I had written, um, or they kind of had a vague mm -hmm. idea that they were interested in writing. Um, but then I had one student, um, who was so determined to be a writer. She was so serious about it. So that when we would have this huge class, and there were a lot of people in the class who were so not serious, and they would try to divert attention as students will do when they haven't done the writing they were supposed to do. So they want you to talk all over here and all that. And that used to drive Tiari crazy. crazy. So she came up to me after class one day and said, these girls are not serious. This is, you should make them, make them be quiet. I'm trying to learn from you, and they won't be quiet, they won't be quiet, I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. You're going to be a writer. They're not going to be writers. Mm -hmm. So what you need to do is to come by and see me a couple of times a week by yourself. We'll talk. We'll talk about your writing. I'll give you assignments. And we'll just do, we'll do this between us because I'm already a writer and I know you're going to be one. And she was so relieved that yeah. she wasn't going to have to suffer through um, <laughs> all of the non-serious writers. But it was, it was really a, um, a wonderful thing for me as, a, as a, a young teacher to come across a student who was so determined to know what it took to be a writer. So that I was, um, I had the wonderful um, experience of being pushed by a student to figure out a way to effectively communicate what I knew. Um, because she so wanted to know. So that it was a, um, it was a wonderful uh, teaching experience for me. Um, and we got to be friends. After she was no longer my student, we kept in touch. Um, I was publishing a magazine called Catalyst at the mm -hmm. time. And I'm always proud that I'm the first person who published her, uh, published a <laughs> short story, and sent her a check. For sent a a check. <laughs> she sent me a check for $100. I was like, what should I do? Should I invest it? Like, how would I manage all this money? <laughs> but we were, that was very important to me as an editor of a magazine because it was uh, funded by Fulton County and I appreciate it um, to this day that they invested in the arts in that way. Um, but I wanted to be clear that part of the money that they were giving me was gonna be used to pay writers. Because I don't care if it's a little tiny three sentence poem, you need to get paid for it if you wrote it. If it's a short story, you should get paid for it so that we always paid yeah. writers. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, so that it was really wonderful. And then once um, she went off to graduate school, um, we stayed in touch, which is probably where some of those letters came from. A lot of the letters. I'm out here in the middle of the prairie. What am I doing here? Why did I decide to do this? But always writing, always writing. Even, you know, in the midst of I love those letters because there's all of the personal... I'm a young woman away from home in Southwest Atlanta for the first time, and this mm -hmm. environment does not have a lot of people that look like me. What should I do? Mm -hmm. I feel crazy, all of that. And then under that was, and this is what I'm writing. This is what I'm working on. This is what I'm trying to figure out. And that's the, the two tracks 
that are mm -hmm. always going to be the two tracks you're on, I think, as a writer. One is, my life is driving me crazy, what am I going to do? And the other one is, what am I writing and why? Mm -hmm. So that she was already asking those questions. And the, you know, the more we talked and the more she um, became the writer that she was going to be, the, the closer we got. So we had the, the wonderful um, experience of realizing we were friends. Yeah, it's been 30 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. There you I go. Mean, I, was, I was a kid, I was like 16. But you know, when you were talking about when you pay, how you paid the writers, you paid me that $100, but you also told me something about money and writing, and you said, you want to be paid for your writing, but you don't want to have to write for money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, I've always kept that, that I don't want to have to write for money, has been as or even more important than, to me than making sure I get paid. Although I do want to get paid, don't get me wrong. Yes. <laughs> I'm all, but this idea of, like, of you're, you're being paid for your work, but you're not selling it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was really important. I mean, there are just so many things over all these years, advice mm -hmm. that you've given me. Because, I mean, when you said that about these connections between black women writers, our numbers are few. Mm -hmm. You're having an experience that's so unique, and very few people have had it. Mm -hmm. And black women writers tend to have also really short careers. So mm -hmm. there are very few people out who've been there long enough that are ahead of you to give you to pass advice back. Mm -hmm. So I really treasure this. I was on, on the internet, and I was asking people about advice they've gotten, writers about advice they've gotten for their mentors. And I was surprised at how many people were saying, I never had a mentor, mm. and I can't, I don't even know how I would be doing this, mm. I mean, without the example. I mean, you talked about how you helped me with my writing, but you also modeled for me what a writing life, a writing life of purpose could look like. Mm. And it helped me, like, when I became a writer and I moved to New York, and everyone was, like, living and dying by who's nominated for what awards, mm -hmm. who's in what magazines. I always say, Pearl never trained me up on awards. Mm -hmm. We never, ever said the word awards. We never talked about them. So we never talked about who's getting reviewed where. We talked about the books and the authors we love and why we love them. But we never talked about that other stuff. So it wasn't imprinted mm -hmm. on me when I was a young writer. So when I got to be an older writer in that world, it didn't turn my head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, excellent. One of the, um, the other things you were um, talking about, those kinds of networks, and the, that when you started looking, you saw that so many of the black women writers um, have mm -hmm. those networks. And it, um, since I'm of a, um, a generation older um, than you, that I remember when I started writing and how helpful it was to me mm -hmm. to have the women writers who were a generation or so older than me mm -hmm. to be um, supportive of what I did, and they always, always were. Um, I mean, all of them were. I remember going to a party at, at Dr. Richard Long's house, who used to be yes. here at Emory, who mm -hmm. I miss every single day. Um, and it was one of those great parties that Richard Long used to have, where it was just a, all the people that you loved were there, and the food was good, and there were books that you wanted to steal in his library, and it was just <laughs> wonderful. And he was having a party for Maya Angelou. And mm -hmm. so I got to the house, and I didn't know her. Um, I knew, of course, of her and who she was, but I didn't know mm -hmm. her. And I came to Richard's house, and so I was kind of, she was in the kitchen, she was cooking. And I was like so nervous about meeting her that I was trying to hide in the living room oh. because she was in the kitchen. And he came out and said to me, Maya will see you in the kitchen now. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So I went to see Maya and she was standing over the pots and everything and she looked up at me and said, ah, there you are. How's your work going? And I've never forgotten it because she actually wanted to talk to me about my writing. Mm -hmm. She took it seriously. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, I'm sitting there having the conversation and my brain is saying, you're talking to Maya about your writing. You're talking to Maya <laughs> about your writing. Because it means everything to have the writers that you admire. To have Alice Walker tell me that she thought something I had mm -hmm. written was wonderful. To have B.B. Moore Campbell, who is my contemporary, mm -hmm. um, who is, has passed away now, um, ask me the critical question um, when I turned in my manuscript from my first novel and my editor who kept it for like six months, eight months and then finally called me and said, this is the worst book I've ever mm. read. Um, it, we can't possibly publish it and don't send it to anyone else because if someone else publishes it, you'll never 
publish another book as long as you live. And I said, wow, I kind of like the book. I thought the book was a little better than that. So I called Bibi and, and told her this heartbreaking news that the woman said this was the worst book she had. The characters are unlikable. Everything you wouldn't want to hear as a writer. And Bibi let me kind of moan on for a while. And then she said, what did your agent say? And I said, I don't have an agent. I didn't know anybody who was a writer who had an agent. The writers I knew self-published, had little old Volkswagens and went around to community <laughs> meetings and read their poems. So she was asking me who was doing business for me. And I didn't understand mm -hmm. that you needed somebody to mm -hmm. do business with for me. So she sent several women, um, black women, to me who were agents. Um, I called the first one, she wasn't there. I called the second one and she became my agent for years. But that was why when it came time to talk to you, I could talk to you about doing business for yourself mm -hmm. and finding someone who could look out for you because someone had done that for me. Mm -hmm. And it was so important to me because it, it made all the difference. I mean, she, the agent told me how to get the manuscript back, how she would get someone else to give me an advance so I could pay back that advance, which mm -hmm. I had spent, of course, um, <laughs> so that they sold the book in one day and it became what looks like crazy on an ordinary day. Yes. So that was... So I always tell, yeah. I always tell young writers that don't believe because one person in Manhattan tells you the book mm -hmm. sucks. Don't believe it, mm -hmm. because that book did so well, and people still stop me in the publics and tell me how much they love that book. So that <laughs> I wanted to take, thank you, <laughs> but I'd, I wanted to take all those things that I had learned um, from the generation above me and from my contemporaries, and then to find a younger writer who really was serious about it, it allowed me to kind of say, okay, now I'm going to tell you. Now you've got to tell somebody else, mm -hmm. and then they'll tell somebody else. We were just in the car today, and she said, put your agent on them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. That. That's just right. like about 20 minutes ago. Right. That was her advice. Because I'm protective. I think that's part of it, that we protect each other as black mm -hmm. women writers. You know, mm -hmm. when I've got an opening, I write plays. So when I have an opening and I'm going crazy, I know my, my mm -hmm. sister writers will know to say, it's going to be fine. It's mm -hmm. going to be wonderful. It's going to be fine. And when I saw the schedule for Tiari's book tour, mm -hmm. I was really afraid for her because it was so every day somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And I said, you can do this. I will send you a text every, every morning day. and say, good morning. Everything's going to be great. And I did. <laughs> for the whole tour and sometimes she'd be like I know everything is going great and sometimes she'd be like oh everything is terrible I'm far from home but the knowing that you've got somebody who's got eyes on you and who wants you to do well who is not pulling mm -hmm. against you who is not saying if her book does well my book isn't going to do yeah. well mm -hmm. if she gets that job I won't get mm -hmm. that job black women writers that I've known don't tend to do that we tend to say there's a job open over here I think Marie should take it I think mm -hmm. this one should be mm -hmm. it and then we help each other move forward I think that's, um, oh. Thank you. Do you think that in generations past when black women were not under consideration for major awards and other things that people looked at as landmarks of success, right? It's only in very recent history that black women have been in the running for things that because of this we made our own ways of assessing our value mm -hmm. that was about impressing, not impressing or just communicating with each other in a different kind of way, that if you didn't have support from other black women writers, you didn't, that, you didn't have anything. Like, we were our world. Mm -hmm. I think that now things are changed more because of more opportunities and things that people, sometimes I feel almost like the connection between black women writers and black writers because it is, I think it's like with a lot of things that because it's not considered a necessity in the same way, that the connection is not as it once was. I think that's true. And I think it's a shame. I think it's kind of like when integration came, people left mm -hmm. all the black resorts and left yeah. all the black businesses and went elsewhere because we could. Rather than adding on, we figured we had to give up one. And I think that there's a, a much greater willingness now to kind of step on and step over each other because we want to be on the New York Times list, we want to get this award, we want to get mm -hmm. this and that. And it's, um, it's a very different way of looking um, at the work that we do that I, that I don't think necessarily lends itself to us doing our best work and certainly not toward 
us working with each other. The other thing that I think it's broken is because we didn't used to even think about being on the New York Times bestseller list. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't think about having a show on Broadway. Mm -hmm. So that, that now when people ask you questions like, aren't you, aren't you hoping you'll get a show on Broadway? And I say, I don't care. I'm a working <laughs> playwright. I have plays all around the country. Broadway doesn't mean anything to me. Mm. Don't you think you want to be have a New York Times bestseller? It's wonderful because you can pay your rent for a year and make your parents <laughs> proud, but it doesn't mean that now you're a real writer. You know, you mm. knew you were a writer before you ever sold a book. You told mm. me you were a writer when you were 16 years old. <laughs> so now that people are telling you that, you don't take it the same way like, huh, I never mm -hmm. knew it before the New York Times told me. You mm -hmm. say back to the New York Times, I told y'all I was a writer. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Which is a different thing. That's right. Um, so Pearl, you uh, talked about giants like B.B. Moore Campbell, um, Alice Walker, Maya Angelou. Um, Tiari, I'm wondering if, the, I'm curious uh, to know if you have current black women writers that uh, sort of help to sustain you as a writer, as a woman, as a friend. You know, I think, well, you know, I, I went to Spelman, so I, I do have a different kind of orientation to understanding black women as mentors. That's what I've, what I've known from the start. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to have kind of a moment of revelation for it. But I do think that black women have been helpful to me. Like, I literally ran into Jewel Parker Rhodes in an elevator, like, oops, oh, excuse me, yeah. like I ran into her. And she invited me to come to Arizona State and work with her um, to get my MFA. Wow. And she took care of me. I worked as her assistant, and she demonstrated to me a way of living as a writer that I had not known before in those two years that I was her assistant. Um, the first award I ever received was from the Hearst and Wright Foundation, which is run by Marita Golden. Mm -hmm. So black women have always been there. Um, when I was published my first book, um, Nikki, Nikki Giovanni invited me to her house <laughs> for the weekend to talk to me about what it would be like to be a public person. And I never thought, I was thinking, oh, I've just written this one book. I didn't think I was ever gonna be a person that would need you know, Nikki Giovanni's helpful hints on the writing life. <laughs> but I will say in the last year, I have done everything. She, all those things yes. she told me, because she said to me, it's coming. You don't know mm -hmm. it, but it's coming. Mm -hmm. And I didn't believe her, but I was like, yes, ma'am, because She's Nikki Giovanni. But, but she had me to her house for a whole weekend. I had my little overnight bag. I was so nervous. I was like, what am I going to talk about? We play Scrabble. But, <laughs> but there's always been that. And also, though, I mean, with every generation, you, every generation in some ways is living an unprecedented life. And so your mentors can tell you what it was like 20 years ago, but every generation faces completely new challenges. So you have your mentors that help you, but then there's also kind of figuring it out. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a, one thing I've really been grateful for in my relationship with Pearl is that, Pearl, you're always open to figuring out this new challenge. Like you don't say, well, this is how we did it and this is how it's done. Like we try to figure out, like even negotiating the internet, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, like how then, what does that mean to be a writer? How do you negotiate? questions of privacy mm -hmm. and what really matters. And the internet makes it so hard to stay out of other people's business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the key, I think, to sanity as a writer is like, when, remember when you were in, in grade school and they would say, keep your eyes on your own paper? <laughs> keep your eyes on your own paper. Stop looking at other people's careers. Look at your mm -hmm. own. But the mm -hmm. internet has made that an entirely different kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So these are the kinds of things, what, I mean, you've read all of our letters. Did you, did you give them all the letters? Oh, oh goodness. <laughs> I have to say that when I was up in the library and I saw that postcard with my handwriting on it, I was like, oh my goodness, which one is that? But no, it's very cool. That was one of my favorite items from the exhibit. <laughs> because we, I mean, I would say we probably exchanged 20 letters a year at least. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So when I saw that my letters were in the collection, I was thinking it could, I mean, it really could be anything. <laughs> <laughs> I have most of the more recent ones. So anyway, I, got I got you. I got you. <laughs> Um, so you both um, have been writing for many years and you have a distinct literary voice. Are there any up and coming writers that you're really excited about? Oh my goodness, there's so many. There's so many up and coming writers. I mean, one thing that's really exciting to me is that there's a kind of a missing in the generations of black women writers. When it came time for me to get blurbs for my novel, An American Marriage, I realized that the black women writers who are, say, 10 years older than me, 
I'll just tell you all, I'm 47. So the ones who would be like in their late 50s, early 60s, that whole generation, they're, they're, they're not publishing the way they once did. Mm -hmm. That gener something, something short circuited. Mm -hmm. um, and we've kind of misplaced a lot of writers that used to be, you know, active. And but and when this next generation, I used to read. I didn't provide blurbs for everyone, but I would read the books because this younger generation would say, you know, they really wanted a black woman to blurb their book. And there were not that many who were actively publishing who could blurb mm. their book. And so I was always busy reading, and I would let any of them call me, and I would talk to them for a couple hours about what it's going to be like to have your first book out. And, but now it's so many of them, they, they can blurb each other, they can <laughs> give each other advice. And that has been really exciting to see that there are so many up-and-coming writers um, in all different genres. That's another thing, too. The different, there's so many different ways of black women writers doing their thing mm -hmm. that there isn't that pressure to tell the one story. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like in the world of mystery, we have Attica Locke. I just mm -hmm. adore her mysteries. Yes. Um, I really love The Turner House by Angela Flournoy. I really like this, um, this short story, Heads of the Colored People. Oh, yes. By mm -hmm. Nafisa Thompson Spires. Better? Spires. Yes. I, think, yeah. I really loved her book. I love, there's a collection of short stories called Meet Behind Mars by Renee Sims. I mean, I could just go on and on. I just love Danielle Evans. Her book yeah. is called Before You Suffocate Your Own Fool Self. Fool Self. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's a great you, must, title. you must love that book. So, I mean, I love that this next generation is, it's so big. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, though, there's so many of them, and there's such a delight in there being so many of them. But then I do think that they will not be quite as close-knit because, mm -hmm. I mean, that is part of the, it's both the pleasure of progress and also the other mm -hmm. side of it is that each of them is not as unique and special to the other as you would in a smaller group. Mm -hmm. But I think that also gives them more freedom. I mean, this is going to, I don't know. Can, does this make sense if I say they have the freedom that they don't have to all like each other? Mm -hmm. You know what I yes. mean? Mm -hmm. There's a freedom in that, I yeah. think. Yeah. That's, I think that's very true because it's not so much that there was a rule that you had to like people, but there were so, such a small number of us that when you went on tour, um, when another black woman writer lived in that town and heard you were coming, we went to find each other mm -hmm. and we would always, you know, do you want to come back to my house and eat? Do you, what do you need? What do you need? Because we knew the person was out there, usually alone, not traveling with agents and managers and all of that. So that it was more of a, um, we're going to surround you with sisterhood on this journey that you're on. But it, it is true. It isn't, it isn't necessary because they have, there's so many more of them and they have so much so many more support systems. And they have people working like with them. Sisterhood is in real life, not metaphorical sisterhood. No, I mean you for know how real. Sisterhood in real life is complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yes, you would be surrounded in sisterhood. Yes, I would say yes. we're all like a family, and I mean that for better and for worse. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> That's right. But the good parts of that would be when I, after BB had given me this great advice, and I had a bestseller, and I was on the road, and I was exhausted. I had been on the road for three weeks, and I got to LA, which is where she lived, and she called me up and said, and we had never met. We had just talked mm -hmm. on the phone. She said, um, okay, I'm going to come and pick you up uh, at the hotel and bring you back to my house. I know you need a home-cooked meal. So I said, okay, that would be great. So she said, and they had me in a, because the book was doing well, they had me at the Four Seasons in Beverly Hills. So that was really <laughs> fun to see people coming back from shopping trips with just, you know, lots and lots of stuff. But she said, okay, I'm going to come and pick you up. I said, fine, I'll meet you out front. She said, I'm in a cherry red Cadillac convertible. Oh. And I laughed. I thought she was kidding. She cruised up in front of my hotel in a cherry red Cadillac convertible. <laughs> I jumped in the car and we headed off into the LA night and I said we are writers now for real <laughs> we are really writers because it's an adventure it's hard and it's grueling being on the road and all of that but it's such a wonderful adventure I mean wouldn't you say that it is it's it's uh, all the good stuff and all the bad stuff but the the adventure of it is something that remains and you're in the midst of a tour so I probably shouldn't ask you <laughs> but, but no I mean I do think that the most exciting thing to me actually has I, I've loved meeting other writers and it's very exciting to meet people you've only heard of and now you know them and you can call them but the, to me the best thing is meeting is the best part about being a black woman writer are black woman readers 
Mm -hmm. Our readers, like, okay, once I'll tell you this. I went to this, Pearl and I, you probably don't even remember this, Pearl. We did this reading together. This is about 15 years ago. And um, I read, she read, I was signing. She had this long signing line all around the corner. <laughs> and I assigned my few people who were interested in me. And, and this woman came and she brought Pearl this jewelry box she had made. And it was full of all this hand beaded earrings. Oh, yeah. And she was showing Pearl the earrings. And she looked at me and said, Oh, you poor thing. She said, you don't have any fans. And then she said, Aww. and she said, Pearl, do you mind? And she went in the jewelry box and got this little pair and said, here, these are for you. <laughs> and I said, thank you. I put them on. Because <laughs> that's what you do. And I thought, we, the, that's the most generous readers, you know, the most generous who would make hand make all these earrings for her, share some with little me. I mean, when I moved to um, New Jersey, I received a hand, a hand knitted Afghan from one of my readers who said, it's really cold up there, you know? <laughs> and when I was in between, I had a time when I was in between contracts, I couldn't get a contract for my book. I was in terrible shape, but I always knew that I had black women readers who would write to me and say, I hope the book is going well, mm -hmm. we're looking forward to it. So that even when the publishers were telling me there was no audience for my work, I knew there was an audience for my work because they had told me so. And that has been the thing that's really unique because, you know, being black publishing, it's hard to make the same amount of sales as your white colleagues. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just racism, pretty much. You don't, <laughs> you don't sell as many books, but I feel that you sell, you have, your readers appreciate you so much. Like, none of your readers take you for granted, and you don't take them for granted, so you have this connection. So the work, you may not, there's a book, there's a program called Book Scan. This thing is the bane of my existence. Um, they can put your name in the book scan and see how many books you sell. Mm -hmm. oh. So if you want to go up for an opportunity, they can just punch it in there. Before book scan, you used to could just act successful and people would take <laughs> your word for it. <laughs> but now they can like actually pull up the numbers. So my book scan may not be the same as my white colleagues, but I feel that my, my heart and my writing life with my readers, I have twice the life that they do. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yes. Amen. <laughs> and um, I'm sure you have, you both have a huge following of uh, black women readers here in Atlanta. I know that uh, my book club uh, reads you all quite often. Um, uh, I'd like to shift gears a bit and talk about you both as writers. So Pearl, you are a writer and figure that's synonymous with the city of Atlanta. And T.R., when the news broke that you uh, would be coming here to Emory, it felt like a homecoming that was sort of long overdue. Um, and Atlanta has loomed so large in both of your works. Can you talk a little bit about um, what's special to you about the city of Atlanta as a writer? Well, I think it's, it's interesting um, that people are surprised that you can set a bunch of books in Atlanta. I mean, I have six novels that are set in Atlanta. I have a number of plays that are set in Atlanta. Because a lot of people who live in New York think there isn't really a real life outside yeah. of New York. Yeah. If you're gonna write a real book, you have to write about New York. If you're gonna write a real play, you have to write about New York. Well, I don't live in New York. Mm -hmm. I live in Southwest Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So I don't even live all over Atlanta. I live in Southwest Atlanta. Atlanta so yes. that my books are set in Southwest Atlanta because that's the community I know. Mm -hmm. um, and I always wanna write about um, what I know, which isn't to say all writers have to do that. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, some people can be you know, can transport themselves to someplace they've never been, and I admire that. But I, I really want to get right, um, to get it right by writing about something that I know well. And I'd, um, I know that I'd, I have uh, had people come to me and talk to me about the books as if they really expect to run into these people on the street, <laughs> yes. which is a, a wonderful thing yeah. um, for me. A woman came up to me. I want to run into Blue. Between, I know, people are always <laughs> looking for Blue Hamilton, always looking for Blue. Um, a woman came up to me and said, I love your new book, and it was one of the uh, novels, I love your new book, but you got something wrong. And I said, mm -hmm. well, Okay, because that's the other thing about our readers, they will tell you. <laughs> I, said, I said, okay, what did I get wrong? And she said, the Krispy Kreme is not across from the Marta Station. The Krispy Kreme is further down Cascade Road <laughs> because in between the time I wrote the book and the time the book was published, the Krispy Kreme moved no. from where it was <laughs> down the block. And the woman was highly indignant that I had misplaced the Krispy Kreme. 
So I explained to her the process of publishing and that the reason was the time that it took. And I said, I swear to you, next book, I will make sure the Krispy Kreme is in its right place. And I did. I put somebody in there going through the drive-thru and talked about how the drive-thru was just the devil's work because you could get donuts so easily. But I'd, I really, I loved her for being so protective of the neighborhood that we both live in and that we both love, that she wanted me to get it right. Yeah. You know, if you're gonna write about our neighborhood, then write about our neighborhood, get it right. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'd, um, I've always found that to be a, a tremendous level of satisfaction, mm -hmm. um, to write about the neighborhood um, where I live, to write about people who could inhabit those places um, where I live. So it's, it's, um, it's been wonderful for me, and it's always funny to me the people who live in New York will be surprised that um, people outside of New York, you know, like us, can set a book in Atlanta and it can actually be a good and interesting book. You know? I mean, I was living in New York up until like about 10 minutes ago and <laughs> I found that when I was in New York, I would tell people I was from Atlanta and it would be kind of confusing to them because when you say you're from the South, they act like you got to Brooklyn on the Underground Railroad. like. <laughs> They expect you to have this super tragic life story because they don't know how we live in Atlanta. They don't know that, I mean, I have found, I feel like Atlanta has more opportunities for me as a black woman than New York, but they can't believe that because just the way that they've constructed their identity and their understanding of politics. And so when I wrote my first book about growing up in Atlanta during the child murders, I wanted to write about it because I felt like our experience, the generation that grew up at that time, that our experience had been forgotten, even, even here at home, that no one really talked about it. And I wanted to write that as a love letter to my generation, as a remembrance. So I wrote that for that reason. But then I kept setting the books in Atlanta because I feel like, one is what I know, but also I feel like there's a space in Southern literature, the black urban Southern experience. Mm -hmm. You know, people think mm -hmm. that Southern literature is about grandmothers and mules. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never even seen a mule in my life. I wouldn't know one <laughs> if it walked in here. <laughs> and so I started kind of self-consciously writing toward that. And also, I'm very interested in the ideas of the way um, black people negotiate questions of class. Mm -hmm. And in the South, you know, like people say, I read somewhere that they say that most people don't know anyone that is from a different class background as they are. But I feel that with black people, we have so much class mobility in a generation because of civil rights. Like my father literally picked cotton as a boy and he is, he's in his 80s now and he has a PhD. So that just imagine what the class range of that is in the family. Mm -hmm. And we have just a lot of movement. And so I always wanted to write about that. And I felt like the South Atlanta in particular gives a lot of space to talk about black upward mobility, downward mobility, all the ways that we know each other. And so that's why I choose Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And also I always want to write a book. I want to write a book where the people seem familiar to me. I want to write a book where the people feel like they live on the page, that they live in the world, not on a page. Mm -hmm. Like that they, I mean, that's just a different style of writing, but I want to feel like if something were to happen, the apocalypse were to happen, that we would leave our books behind and people could see what happened. Mm -hmm. That's uh, very powerful, especially as someone from the South and um, definitely appreciating um, you all depicting the South uh, in a certain way, basically everything that um, you've said, that there um, is life here in the South that's not um, rural. Um, do you all consider yourself Southern writers? I do now. Ms. I didn't Detroit. for a long time. <laughs> yeah, because I, I grew up in Detroit. So I, I, for a long time, I was, you know, one of those transplants who would say, you know, I'm, I'm from Detroit, I'm from Detroit, I'm from Detroit, because that's where I grew up. And then, of course, because all the real Atlanta people would never let you forget that you weren't from here. It's like, no, you've only, you've only been here 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, they still won't let me be from Atlanta. But it's, um, so I, I, for a long time I didn't, um, Southern writer to me, uh, met Faulkner, you know, it, it, mm -hmm. it was not something that I thought about because I didn't identify with the region. Mm -hmm. I identified racially. Mm -hmm. I identified as a black writer. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in a black nationalist household so that we were less focused on the region we were living in and more focused on the race that we were. Mm -hmm. So that it took me a long time to think about 
to get my mind comfortable with the idea of calling myself a Southern writer. Mm -hmm. But I live in the South and I write in the South mm -hmm. about a Southern place. So I, I don't think I can deny it. I mean, mm -hmm. I think in, if we're gonna do definitions, I would have to call myself a black woman, Southern writer, feminist. <laughs> <laughs> So it's kind of like, okay, how many, how many kinds of, uh, you know, labels can you have, you know? But I, 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 I'm comfortable with that one. I guess that's fine. I mean, I'm a Southern writer. It's not even complicated. Like, but I am a member of the Fellowship of Southern Writers, which is an organization. There are 50 Southern writers, and they induct another. They only bring in a new writer if another writer passes away. So it's a very, mm. and I'm one of the few black people in the Fellowship of Southern Writers. And I do think that, like, I've always wanted to be called a Southern writer. And I, up until very recently, I just was not. I was called a black writer mm -hmm. because they will only let you be one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. And a lot, of, a lot of my white Southern colleagues, they're trying to break out of that. They feel like that's a, a pigeonhole or a niche for them to be called a Southern writer. They want to, you know, they want to break out. And I'm trying to break in. <laughs> <laughs> but it is important for me that black writers identify as Southern. This is our home. We have so much history here in the South. It's very specific to the South. And I just, I just hold it up. And like when there's a Southern writers event and I'm not invited, I'm mad. As a matter of fact, I was on the phone today with the guy from Time Magazine. You know, they had that issue on the South. He called me about something else. I was like, well, before we go any further, we need to talk about why you didn't call me about this Southern thing. Yeah. And he said, oh, it was by no means comprehensive. I was like, obviously. <laughs> but he promised me I'll be in the next one. Okay. Excellent. Um, in closing, um, I'd like to bring us back uh, to where we started with the concept of mentorship. And I think that you all have uh, really dropped some gems for us um, in terms of the advice that you've received from a mentor. But what advice might you give to your younger self about being a writer? <laughs> I would say don't worry so much. But I would say that about every area of my life, not just writing. Um, but I, I was so intensely focused on being a writer. Um, but I was also worried about how I would make a living, whether or not I had anything to say, whether or not the boys would ever move aside so that we girls could have something to say, all of those um, things that I worried about a lot. Um, and I think that the, the idea of being able to relax into what you are as early as you possibly can um, is always something wonderful because, and you can't control that. Sometimes you can know who you are and relax into it when you're 25. Sometimes you have to be 70 to do it. But whenever you do it, it's gonna be um, that moment when you say, oh, this is what, this is what I'm doing. So I think that the, the biggest thing would be um, not to worry because I've, I've always been very disciplined. I've always been able to meet a deadline. You know, I've always found opportunities and pursued them and all of that. So I think it's, it's basically just the relax and do your work. You know, don't drive yourself crazy. You'll be fine. Thanks. You know, I think I would give myself the advice, which actually, <laughs> she gave me the advice, but I would have given it to myself before she had a chance to give it to me, which is that it's okay to quit things. Mm. You know, when I went to graduate school, um, I didn't want to be in graduate school. I only went to graduate school to get a PhD because I was being discouraged from every side to try from trying to be a writer because they were my family and some of my other mentors. Everyone was worried about how I was going to make a living. And so they said, go get the PhD, go do that, and you can do your writing, whatever this is. You can do that on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And I took the, what does that test? The GRE, and I made a good score, so I was given a fellowship to go get this PhD. I was 20 years old. And I was so unhappy. It just wasn't what I wanted to do. And I wrote Pearl this long letter about how unhappy I was and how I had other plans and I wanted to write a book, maybe about the Atlanta child murders. I wrote her all this long, long, long letter. And she sent me back a postcard and she said, <laughs> leave that place. <laughs> it said something like, you can quit, nothing's going to happen. It's your life. <laughs> and I said, really? <laughs> Because you know, I had always been told you have to finish what you start, you know? And, and get, I quit, and guess what? Nothing happened. It was fine. <laughs> so I think I would have told myself that earlier, that the, you may feel like the responsibility for yourself, for the race, for everyone is on your shoulders, but it's really not. Do what you need to do to make your life better.
And you know, I remember that because I remember feeling like um, the responsible thing for me to do was to say, stick it out, and I knew that Mac and Barbara would kill me if I told you you should drop out and all of that. But it was like, you know, trying to write the responsible letter and then saying, this woman is a writer like you. Mm. She's dying out there, mm. you know? So that's why it was down to the postcard. So it was like, what do you really want to say? And all I really wanted to say was leave there now. Get on the plane, pack your stuff yeah, and come home. Yeah, just imagine me reading it and then start packing. That's right. <laughs> pack your stuff and come home, that's right. That's right. Yes, well, we're so glad that you're home uh, now. Um, thank you both so much for sharing this evening with us. Oh, this has you. been um, so lovely and uh, getting to know more about your relationship to one another and um, how black women writers, either in your own personal life or um, ones that you've read or your readers have um, impacted your own work is uh, so amazing. And I'm so honored to uh, have you all with us this Thank evening. You. Thank you. Um, so now what we are going to do um, is actually give you all the opportunity to um, ask questions. Um, so if you are, uh, we'll take questions from Facebook Live, um, and then uh, we will also take questions from those of you that are in the ballroom. So there are two microphones um, right here uh, in the front, so you can begin um, to line up uh, there for your question. So that we can take as many questions as uh, possible, please do take a few moments to um, formulate your question. Okay, we'll start. Wait, where is the... Okay. Uh, Over here? So, uh, oh, her microphone's not here, so let's do this. All right, well, we're gonna start maybe on the side where the microphone publishing company that I sent it to basically told me that it wasn't worth publishing. So what do I do? Like, I don't even know where to begin. I've been having this story for so long that I'd like to present, and I don't even know where to begin with it. Have you, have you written the book already? Yes. So you're, you're looking for a publisher, basically? Is that where I begin? Like, do I look for an agent or do I look for a publisher? Do you have an agent? I don't. Okay, it's, it's, it's better to have an agent before you have a publisher, but um, those are real specific. Can you um, just talk, stop and talk to me for a second afterward? Sure. Um, because that's, a, that's like a, um, you're starting, you need all of that in order okay. to protect yourself. Or you can look at the whole idea of self-publishing, which is much more possible now than it used to be. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit after. Okay, great. Okay, thank probably. you. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate your saying you needed this because I needed this a lot. I've been watching the hearings all day. <laughs> and I think all of us as Americans um, and as people who believe in freedom and as people who believe in truth, I think we have to think deeply about what's happening to our institutions. I think we have to think deeply about our responsibility as American people. And if you didn't see any of that hearing today, just look at a little bit of it. Look at what the woman who stepped forward against all sanity to tell the truth as a good citizen, look at what she had to say, and then look at the response of the men, of Republican men on that committee who had something to say. Because we have to, as, as American people, and Terry will tell you how long it took me to even call myself an American person, um, but we have to think deeply as Americans about what that mess that went on today in Washington means for all of us. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're gonna take a, a question from uh, Facebook Live. This is a question for uh, both you, Pearl, and Tiari. Um, what is your all-time favorite book or novel? And we don't have to say each other's books. We can. <laughs> <laughs> Not required. <laughs> it, it really depends on, I don't have an all time, it's like what, what novel is, 
book or novel is speaking to me at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, like about five years ago, I was kind of obsessed with Tar Baby by Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because I was writing a novel that was raising some of the same questions mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. it. Um, and right now I'm writing something about Anne Petrie's The Street. Mm. You know, and it was published, I want to say in 47, mm -hmm. or she sold a million copies. Mm. And she's kind of fallen off the radar. She was the first black woman to sell a mil, this is a million copies before Twitter, you know, before, mm -hmm. you know, there weren't even, there weren't even as million, many people in the country to buy the million copies. And she, she did this. And I've been really obsessed with her career and that novel, The Street. I would think it's because it's hard to pick one. I mean, I have many that I like, but I think one that made a big impression on me um, was The Temple of My Familiar by Alice Walker mm -hmm. um, because it was so not what I expected from Alice Walker, which I've learned not to expect anything from <laughs> Alice Walker because she's going to give me what she's supposed to give me at that moment. But that book was so expansive and so um, able to go beyond what people had kind of put in the box of this is what black women writers are allowed to write about. She was writing about reincarnation. She was writing about all kinds of things, a 500-year-old woman walking through the book. And just it was just a wonderful, amazing book. So I would have to say that The Temple of My Familiar is one that, that really has continues to be a one that I go back to just for the pleasure of opening to any page and saying, oh, I remember that's the story about the feathers. Oh, I remember that's the story about this and that. Thank you. Okay. Hello, I'm Azali Scales. I'm a senior at Spelman College. All right, Spelman. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to say thank you so much for being here. I love An American Marriage. It's like by far my favorite novel. Um, but I wanted to ask, as someone who's more like comfortable with academic and stiff writing, how should I nurture my creative writing skills? Um, you know, just practice. Just, do you keep a journal? I do, every day. Are you stiff in your journal? No, but more so just like, capturing, I guess, similar to what you all talked about and capturing the city of Atlanta, like how do I capture stories? So I'm, I'm into sociology, so I do like a lot of type of ethnography, so I want to know how do I really tell the stories of other people um, in a, I guess, like a free way that is not just jaded or biased, but, you know. You're going to be biased, and that's okay. okay. Your bias is your point of view, and every, we each, that's a good thing. Mm. So I think that's one thing. Don't try to run from your point of view. It's not a, what is it, what is it they say? It's not a bug, it's a feature. Yes, yeah, so that's, <laughs> okay. that's what that is. But just, you know, don't worry. It sounds like you're worrying about what someone else is going to say about it. You're critiquing it as you're writing it. Writing and publishing are two different things. Writing is where you can be free. It's just between you and the page. And later on, worry about what someone else is going to think. Worry about an audience later. But just write for your own pleasure. Mm -hmm. Write a story that speaks to your heart. And once you do that, it will be free, it will not be stiff, and you just worry about all that other stuff later. Thank you. And eavesdrop on people, listen <laughs> to people. You wanna write about Atlanta, go someplace in a public place and sit and listen to people. I mean, that's, that's a, a great story you have about an American marriage. But just listen to people, because not only will you get great stories, um, but you also will um, be able to be more familiar with the rhythms of how people talk. Um, listen to a conversation and then see if you can reproduce it. Listen to what people are saying when they're um, arguing in a public place, trying to keep their voices down. What do they say when they're arguing in a public place and don't care about keeping their voices down? <laughs> you know, but just listen to people. You know, listen to what they say and try to figure out how much you can glean from what they actually say and then from the things they're not saying yes, and, and put it in your journal. Say. Write it down. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Dr. Carla Booker. I'm former faculty at Morehouse School of Medicine. And I want to just say I'm just moved. I'm moved by the warmth in the room, by the, the personal relationship I feel I have with you, having never met you, either one of you. <laughs> and I'm really curious, because I, I really feel that there's something about the mentorship and the sisterhood and the auntie and the mother-daughter that is going on on this stage that we need to have in this country. Um, I'm a physician here in Atlanta, I'm 55 years old, so on the end of my career. And so there were no black female physicians, and I was here in Atlanta, Georgia Baptist or Atlanta Medical Center doing my residency. So I'm trying to figure out how is it that we're in the same generation and that mentorship was not there for me as a physician, and I want to be able to give it going forward. So how is it that, what, 20 years ago? 30. 30 years ago that you all had this and have this warm, powerful humility that I just feel like we want to have as black women. And I feel like sometimes there's this 
something that says, yeah, it's mutually exclusive. I can't have it and you have it too. And how can we do that for ourselves as black women and also to do it for ourselves as Americans and human beings? Because that's the end to all the stuff you're talking about that's going on today. So I want to acknowledge that. You know, I, I believe that when you help, like when I teach, I tell my students when they find out about opportunities, like they'll try to hoard an opportunity. They'll find out there's a fellowship and they won't tell the others because that'll lessen their own chance of getting it. And I have to tell them that's okay. You, you have to let the others try, mm -hmm. even if it means that yeah. it could cost you. Because I think that, I mean, the students, they know that the more people who apply, the lesser your own chance is of getting it. That's just the truth. So the reason you share with others is not that we can both have it. Because there are going to be some things we can't both have, but that's not the point. Mm -hmm. The point is that we can all have the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is a thing to learn. People are so afraid of losing something, but I don't think the answer is to tell them they won't lose. The answer is that you, you might lose that, but what you gain from helping someone is more valuable than that thing you might lose. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> I also think the thing about mentoring is that the word itself sounds so formal. Um, and I'm sure that I've, I've played a mentoring role. But the, you know, the, the fact is, I don't think of myself as her mentor. You know, we're friends. You know, so she that there's my been, mentor, though. There's, yeah. No, I don't. I, I don't, feel like she just kicked me out the nest. No, no, no. No, no. Never, never. Oh no, no, no. But I, I mean, the idea of, because there's, I've, I have um, run into lots of talented young women, and I try to give them the benefit of what I can give them. Um, and then there, it's just like in life, and then you meet somebody who actually is gonna be a friend of yours. Mm -hmm. So that of course the mentoring will always go on, because I'll always be older. But it's like, you know, there's things that, that you know and have experienced that I haven't. I mean, I can't even figure out the password on my phone. <laughs> so it's, you know, just the whole idea, you know, of talking about social media and all of that. So I think it's, if you're trying to pass on some of what you, you longed for and didn't get, um, don't think of it so much in the abstract as a mentoring thing. Find a young woman that you like and then tell her what you know. You know, take her out to have a cup of tea or a glass of wine or whatever and talk about things because it, it's not really, I don't think it becomes after a while a formal thing of, okay, now you're home from your tour. How did it go? And I'll tell you how I'm feeling about it. You know, it's kind of like, let's go have dinner and tell me how it's going. So find somebody that you, that you like and tell them what you know. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Carolyn Jackson, and I write for a couple of blogs that I'm going to plug in a little bit. Uh, but um, in those groups that I work with, a, a couple of times it'll come up, who's your favorite author? So they don't really like to ask me that anymore, because they know I'm going to say Pearl Clay. What's your favorite book? What looks like crazy on an ordinary day? So who knows how many books I've sold for you? Thank you. Just simply by every Thank single you. time they ask me that. That's... I plug you all the time. So here's my question. The book cover, the original, which I would love to have had you autograph that particular once, but I bought a new one that you, you can autograph that one for me. Um, what was the inspiration with that? The book caught my eye, one, because Oprah told me to read it, mm -hmm. and then two, the cover was so unique. What was the inspiration behind that? And then here's my part two question. Can I have blue? And is um, Ava your favorite character? Because she's actually my favorite hero. You know, is my she, favorite Shiro, she my, my Ava favorite. Johnson. Ava Johnson is my favorite Shiro. Right, okay. And so those are all my questions for you. So. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, 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 so the her. first question is I about just the, cover, yeah, the, the, the cover. The cover of the, of the first edition where she's lassoing the moon or something. Absolutely. What was the inspiration behind that? Um, totally not my uh, choice. Didn't have any input into that at all and actually didn't hmm. like that cover at all. Um, but Love uh, it. people have liked it a lot, so it. I was wrong. Um, because you people did, wrong. people did it. embrace it, yeah. So that that it was um, oftentimes the author doesn't have much uh, to say about the cover um, of the book, and I didn't. Mm. That was their um, their design, not mine. But um, but it came, it was all right. It did fine, and people liked it, so it was fine. And what was what you asked me about favorite the other? Favorite Shiro. About Shiro. Shiro. Like favorite Shiro. Uh, my Hero? favorite Shiro. Yes. yes. Is it uh, Ava? 
Is Ava mine my is favorite Ava. one? Is Ava's Ava. mine. Be um, yours. Of, a, of all the women that I've written about, mm -hmm. I can't really pick like that. I love Ava so much, mm -hmm. but I also love, you know, some of the other women who have done mm -hmm. other things. I love the women in my plays, so I can't really pick up. That's kind of like picking among your kids. Mm -hmm. So I, I love them all. I let them all stay okay. in that circle. And one last one for Tahari. Okay. What's your inspiration for writing? Mm -hmm. Your inspiration for writing? In general? Yes. Oh, it really varies. I mean, it varies with my mood. I think c consistently the inspiration is always to try to figure out an answer to a question that is something, a question that's bothering me in my own life, and I, then I, I use the stories to try to work it out, I think. But I don't, like, I don't write books about people, people I know. Sometimes people say, who are these people really? And I'm like, they're not real. They're actually not anyone. <laughs> they think I'm lying, but they really are imaginary. Uh -huh. But the questions that they raise tend to come from my own life. I'd like to prattle around in Okay, thank then. you so thank much. Uh, so we are going to uh, take one final question over Aww. here on this side. Good evening. I just want to seize the opportunity to um, say how I can kind of feel your kindness coming through. You probably don't remember me, but um, I, my mother had passed away, and I met you at the Gordon Juice Bar, and I had told you about all I wanted was my mother's letters. My f father had written her from World War II, and he must have written something provocative, and she would, he would say, I can't wait to get home, and then he'd cut it out. So there was this letter with all these holes yeah, in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so you said, you know that's a book, don't you? And I said, it is. And you said, I'm going on book tour. Write something, and when I get back, I'll help you. So I used to see you out and I'd hide because I hadn't written anything. And you said, I'm not going to bug you about writing. If you want to write, I'll help you. And I just thought that was so kind. And then one time you said um, the do material. Do you mind uh, going for it with your question? No, uh, and wanted... I just wanted to thank okay. her for being kind. And I, I never got started. But this evening has really, since I saw how you mentored her, I really would take the opportunity to, to write. It's been very inspiring to me. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.